Right, uh, good morning everyone. Okay, so today our class is quite early. So I hope everyone is okay. So today we will continue uh, chapter 3. So it's a new chapter for this uh, week. Okay, so uh, I have to first admit chapter 3 is quite difficult because the difficulty level is going up. So right now you will find that chapter 3 is quite challenging. But chapter 3 is very important because it will be the bridge uh, for you to understand, especially chapter 4, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Okay, so chapter 3, if you have some difficulty, it's very normal. But uh, I have to also remind you that uh, chapter 3 is quite critical, meaning that if you can't catch up chapter 3, and then chapter 4 will be somewhat quite difficult later on. Alright, but I will try my best. Okay, as I said, uh, online has online classes has its own challenges as well when you're teaching engineering courses. Okay, but we will go on, I will try to go slowly uh, so that you can catch up with what we learn. Right, so I would always... Uh, correlate what you learned in the previous chapter with this chapter so that you will understand and you will not get confused later on when you have too many, when you learn as you progress uh, more chapters and chapters, then you get tend to get a bit confused the correlation within each of the chapter, right? So I will just recap back what you have done in chapter 2 so that you can understand chapter 3, right? In chapter 2, if you realize from the tutorial that we have done yesterday and the previous day, you have already started to design reactors or basically you started to calculate the volume of the reactors if given let's say the conversion and so on and so forth however the two most important information that you need okay to do the calculation in chapter two was this two types of information. Basically, they are the same information, but they are presented in a different way, right? So the first uh, way, it was the conversion uh, versus minus RA. So that meaning that for each of the conversion, you are given the information, how much is the minus RA for each of the conversion. So we need to say that you are using this table of information. Let's say if I know my conversion is 0 0.2, my minus RA is 0 0.42. Okay, so based on this information, I calculate the volume of the reactor. And this same information can also be represented in terms of what a plot, we call it level sphere plot. So this level sphere plot, the only difference is that the conversion is still the same, but the minus RA is now presented in the form of one per minus RA. So that's the only difference that, so just that the, if the value of the minus RA is no longer given as minus RA, it's given as one per minus RA. So that's the only difference. But the, the gist of it is that you will use this information to calculate the volume of the reactor, which is we learn PFR as well as CSDR. So that's what you have done for the past two days. Okay, but you must remember, you can calculate the volume because you are given X and minus RA. But how do we actually determine minus RA? So for those who forget what is minus RA, is the rate of disappearance of A. Okay, so we, once we know for every conversion how much A disappear, we use this information to calculate the volume of PFR, the volume of CSDR. But you must also remember someone has already found out your minus RA. So the next question will be, how do we determine minus RA? So you must understand... Uh, for each of the reaction, okay, regardless whatever reaction, I already told you that regardless one reactant ke, two reactant ke, there will be one reactant that we call it A, which is where we calculate the basis of calculation, the reactant A, one reactant. Okay? So for each of the reaction, for each of the conversion, someone has determined the rate of disappearance of A, or meaning to say how much concentration of A disappear for every unit time. Let's say lah, uh, it's 10 mole per dm cube second meaning for every second 10 more the 10 mole per dm cube of a will be lost for every second if the minus ra is that value but who how do we calculate that how do we found out that okay so this is what you're going to learn in chapter three we learn how do we determine minus ra the rate of disappearance of a okay so if you wonder what is a 
in your reaction you have reactant kalau satu reactant terus reactant tu adalah A lah kalau you have more than one reactant you have to identify which reactant yang dijadikan sebagai A di mana where the basis of calculation is based on that reactant so that is the difficulty now is when we want to find out how do we calculate minus Re okay so if you Forget what is minus Re. We want to know the rate of how much the concentration of A disappear with time. Okay, logically, the higher rate means the higher number of the minus Re, the better it is. Means more A can be converted for every unit time. So now we have to determine how do we find minus Re. And you must remember, we have many types of reaction. We have many types of reactant, many types of product. So that becomes the issue or the challenge when we are doing reactor design because each of reaction will have its own way to calculate minus Re. So that become the issue, the problem in chapter 3 that you have to really understand. How do I determine minus Re, which is the rate of disappearance of A or we can also call it the rate of reaction. Okay, All right. So minus Re, the rate of disappearance of A or we also call it reaction rate. Okay, general, kita harus panggil dia kadang tindak balas. Okay, this reaction rate minus Re is given by a model or we call it a power law model. Okay, so again, I must remind you that this minus Re, the rate law or the power law model is very specific to the reaction. So meaning if you change your reactant, okay, or it is the different types of reaction, even though it, you may produce the same product, but you use different raw material, or sometimes you use same raw material, you produce different product due to different mechanism, it is of a different rate law. So rate law ni dia macam IC kepada tindak balas. Setiap tindak balas, dia ada specific rate law dia yang we have to find out or we have to determine. Okay, so this rate law is given in terms of what we call as power law model which is minus RA equals to K. So now you see you have another new parameter or a new symbol that you will have to learn. We call it as K. Okay, I will explain to you later what's K. Right, so Whatever, regardless reaction, K2 akan ada. Okay? K is a value. We call it as reaction rate constant. I will explain you later. But K is, we call it as reaction rate constant. Kemala kada tindak balas. So for each of reaction rate, for all reactions, you will have a value of K. But the value of K changes lah according to the reaction. And later, we also learn how the value of K changes with other parameter. Okay, so that's first, reaction rate constant. Next one, you will see Ca uh, power alpha and Cb power beta. Okay, so what is alpha, what is beta, what is Ca, what is Cb? Okay, so you have learned C, right? C is concentration, right? So you have C subscript A, it means concentration of A. So C subscript B, concentration of B. So this refers to the concentration of your reactant. So for example, in this case, I have reactant A, reactant B. So I will have concentration of A, concentration of B, okay? But you must remember, not necessarily kalau ada dua reactant, dalam rate law ini, dia mesti, uh, they will have both concentration. It's not necessarily. Okay, dia mesti concentration reactant, definitely. Okay, but tak semestinya dia akan meliputi kedua-dua. Kalau kamu, let's say you have two reactant, not necessarily mean it must be both concentration. It can be either one. It can be both. Okay, so it, again, if you ask, Macam mana kita nak tahu, later we will learn how do we determine which concentration will be in the rate law. But regardless, the concept, dia mesti concentration reactant. So, katakanlah kamu ada dua reactant, eh? dia boleh jadi CA, CB, dia boleh jadi CA, dia boleh jadi CB. So, how do we know? Shortly later, I will teach you how do we determine this. Okay, so again, for those who ask, macam mana kita nak tahu rate law ni, okay, for those common reaction ataupun kebanyakan tindak balas yang telah 
uh, people discover or people uh, we have already discovered, someone has already done the study. Someone has already determined the rate loss sebenarnya. Okay, so it's the easiest way. Unless you have a new reaction. Okay, katakanlah kamu ada tindak balas baru di mana kamu tengok kat literature, kamu tengok kat paper, kamu tengok kat Google, tak ada orang yang you still do not know yet the rate law. So for this case, Later dalam chapter 5, we will learn how to determine rate law kalau dia adalah tindak balas yang sangat baru di mana nobody has done the study to determine it. But if you have a very common reaction, most likely someone tu dah determine dah rate law dia tu macam mana. Maksudnya nilai K tu berapa, KCACB tu ada tak dalam model dia ke C A sahaja ke, C B sahaja ke. Someone has already done the study. Okay, so just that you have macam mini project. Saya rasa nanti dalam stage kedua, there's one student yang dikena cari rate law ni dengan nilai K dan sebagainya. So just remember that kalau tindak balas tu dah tindak balas yang very common, someone dah determine value K tu berapa. Ada tak concentration E, ada tak concentration B dalam dia punya rate law model. Okay, then the next one, you see dia ada kuasa alpha, kuasa beta. Okay, so this is power lah kan. Okay, so alpha and beta is what we call as reaction order or in bahasa Melayu we call it as tetik tindak balas. Okay, but I think reaction order is easier for you to understand. So the power alpha, the power beta, the alpha refers to the power of the concentration of A, beta refers to the power of the concentration of B. And both of these are what we call as reaction order. Okay, so alpha and beta ni pun adalah nombor, dia kuasa kan? So the number can be zero, can be 1, can be 2, can be more than that. So, it can be 3, it can be 4. So, dia boleh jadi integer, angka bulat. So, macam 0, 1, 2. So, maknanya the reaction order is 0. Okay, satu, 1 normally we call it first order. Okay, it can be second order. It can be also third order, fourth order. So, on and so forth. Maksudnya, alpha tu boleh jadi 0, 1, 2, 3 atau 4. Although, typically, biasanya year is between 0, 1 or 2. So in my class, I only covered when alpha and beta is 0, 1 or 2. Means 0 order, first order, second order. Tapi you have to remember, tak semestinya dia hanya 0, 1, 2. But the common reactions are usually 0, 1 and 2. And dia boleh jadi juga fraction. So you can also become a fraction 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. But Again, that is quite rare. Okay, so you must remember again. Macam like orang tahu alpha, beta ni 0 ke, 1 ke, 2 ke. You must understand someone has already done the studies. But later on dalam chapter 5, you will also learn. Mantan nanti kemudian when you go to the real world, let's say your plan or your R&D in your plan has discovered a new type of reaction. Tapi kamu kena, so you have to remember why this is important. Because then you have to design the reactor, right? Without knowing minus RA, you cannot design the reactor. You cannot determine the volume of the reactor. Sebab tu, minus RA ni sangat penting integral to any reactor. Action. Without knowing minus Ra, for that particular reaction, you cannot design reactor. So, dalam chapter 5, you will learn how to find that on your own. But so far, until chapter 3, chapter 4, kita akan assume maklumat itu diberi ataupun kita boleh dapat tahu from certain information which I will teach you how do we determine. Okay, right. So, that's the first step. Macam mana kita dapat minus RA sebab sebelum ni dalam chapter 2 uh, nilai X, nilai minus RA diberi. So you have no idea macam mana nilai RA, minus RA itu kita boleh dapat. So today chapter 3 baru kita belajar macam mana kita dapat minus RA. So the minus RA is based on the power law model. So power law model says minus RA equals to K, reaction rate constant. Concentration of reactant, Ca, Cb, Ca power alpha, alpha is the reaction order for A, Cb beta, kuasa beta, beta is the reaction order of B. So when you talk about reaction order, you have to be very specific because the reaction order is specific to which concentration. So let's say you say first order, you must say first order with respect to A atau first order with respect to B. Okay, second order with respect to A or second order with respect to B. You just cannot say second order because when you say second order, there are few interpretation terhadap kepekatan reactant yang mana. Okay, so even when I give information, it is clearly stated. Okay, so let's say lah, we have this reaction. 
this power law model. Okay, we can say that the reaction is alpha order with respect to reactant A and beta order with respect to reactant B. So, macam saya katakan lah, first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. Tak semestinya alpha dengan beta tu mesti sama. Dia boleh jadi zero order with respect to A, first order with respect to B or first order with respect to A, second order with respect to B. So, Uh, order tindak balas tu tak semestinya harus sama. Dia boleh berbeza. Okay, for those yang nak wonder, macam mana dia tahu someone has done the studies or later on dalam chapter 5, sorry, kenapa tempat dah? Okay, later on in chapter 5, chapter 5, you will really learn by yourself. This, sekejap eh, saya punya ni macam, oh, sekejap. Okay. Connection is loose. Right, later on in chapter 5, eh, saya punya ni loose. Okay, so later on in chapter 5, you will learn by yourself how do we determine uh, the reaction order of this alpha and beta. So you see, uh, so I keep emphasizing reaction ni, the challenge is that dia kena faham kesinambungan atau the continuity between each chapter to one another. So let's say if you are not really good, uh, you are Or not, I will not say not really good. Let's say you haven't yet mastered chapter 2 or if, or you struggle in chapter 2, you find it a bit hard in chapter 3. So I will try to go slow so that you can catch up one by one. Right? Okay, so back to here. So then, after you know the reaction order with respect to each reactant, then you can then mention the overall order. So the overall order merujuk kepada the overall order of the reaction lah. So overall order reaction will be Alpha plus beta. So, for example, let's say I say first order with respect to A. First order with respect to B. So, overall order will be 1 plus 1, second order reaction. So, I can say the overall order as second reaction, a uh, second order, but I have to clearly mention, macam mana saya dapat second order tu? Adakah dia lah first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. Dia boleh jadi juga second order with respect to A. Dia boleh jadi juga second order with respect to B. Sebab tu I said, overall order ni, kita, well, even if we mention the overall order, we have to still clearly mention the order of towards each of the concentration. Kalau tak, you cannot write out the uh, power law model. Okay, so Bear in your mind, setiap tindak balas dia akan ada persamaan minus RA dia yang tersendiri. So that become the challenge for you when you do chapter 4. Sebab you have to bear in mind, bila minus RA berubah, design equation dia pun akan berubah. So that becomes a bit of a confusion. Although equations are provided, but yang tu akan menjadi a bit confused tak? Eh, bila saya nak guna equation ni? Bila saya nak guna equation ni? Right, okay. So first let us understand first when I say zero order ke, first order ke, second order ke, apa maksud dia. Okay, so again I repeat, not necessary semua tindak balas hanya ada tertib dia adalah zero, one or second. It can be other, it can be three, it can be four, it can be fraction. But the usual one, the common one, normally tindak balas dia adalah zero order, first order dan second order. So apa maksud dia? Okay, so let's say... Zero order reaction. So, when zero order reaction, mini dia adalah zero order terhadap A dan juga zero order terhadap B. So, kamu ingat kan? Any number yang kuasa kosong, dia menjadi satu. Empat kuasa kosong, empat. Eh, sorry. Empat kuasa kosong jadi satu. Lima kuasa kosong jadi satu. Dia satu. Okay, so, I can write down the red law as minus RA equals to K. Sebab CA kuasa kosong adalah satu, CB kuasa kosong pun satu. Maksudnya dia lah zero order towards A, zero order towards B, ataupun uh, anyways, dia akan menjadi satu, right? So, the concentration tu dah tak ada dalam power law model kamu. So, jadi minus RA equals to K. So, what is K? As I said, it's a reaction rate constant. Pemala kadar tindak balas. Dia lah number. It's a number. Okay. So again, macam mana kita tahu nombor tu? I will teach you shortly later on macam mana nak cari K. Okay. So, what does it mean by if we say that? Dia yeah, bermaksud, if the reaction is zero order, bila kamu ubah kepekatan reactant, dia tak ada kesan terhadap kadar tindak balas kamu punya kadar tindak balas. Sebab, remember, minus R A ni lah kadar kehilangan A. So, maksudnya, kalau kalau kamu tengok sebelah kanan ni tak ada sebarang uh, kepekatan. Maksudnya, kadar tindak balas saya tak dipengaruhi langsung oleh kepekatan reactant saya. Ia hanya dipengaruhi oleh nilai K. Ini, if I want to increase my reaction rate, saya nak tindak balas saya lebih cepat, saya 
saya manipulasi keperkataan pun takkan ada efek terhadap kadar tindak balas saya. Saya hanya perlu manipulasi nilai K. Okay, but I will teach you shortly later. Nilai K ni dipengaruhi oleh parameter lain yang kita boleh manipulate. So, means kalau I want this reaction to be fast, okay, I cannot touch the concentration. It will not change my rate, but I can change, I can increase my value of K, which I will teach you shortly later on. How do we do what we do we do to increase the value of k so ini maksudnya uh, when you have a zero order reaction okay sebab tu dah penting untuk faham tindak balas kau ni zero order ke first order ke second order sebab if you understand the order you will know what i can do to increase the rate of reaction kau kena ingat lebih tinggi nilai kadar tindak balas lebih baiklah tindak balas tu sebab lebih banyak a yang boleh hilang pada satu unit masa itu we want a fast reaction okay so as mentioned here the change in concentration of reactant and product with time produces a straight line so maksudnya kadar tindak balas ni kalau kamu kacau keperkataan kamu naikkan keperkataan reactant ke kamu kurangkan keperkataan reactant pun kadar tindak balas dia masih sama okay so that's that's what it means by zero order reaction okay so we go to the next one first order reaction okay so First order reaction, kamu kena faham maksudnya katakanlah kamu ada satu reactant sahaja which is reactant E. Definitely first order itu merujuk kepada kepekatan reactant A. So means first order with respect to A. Maksudnya Ca alpha tu satu. Tetapi if you have two reactant and let's say the information kata first order reaction, kamu kena find out is it first order with respect kepada reactant A atau or first order with respect to reactant B. Okay, dia boleh jadi salah satu. Okay, so macam dalam kes ini, you have to be clearly find out. Okay, from literature, from Google ke, or from journal ke, from books or in my test or exam, I will clearly mention first order with respect to reactant A or first order with respect to reactant B. Sebab dia akan memberikan kamu dua red law yang berbeza. If I say it's first order with respect to reactant A, I will get minus Ra equals to KCA. CA power 1 adalah 1, right? Okay, so I put it here, CA, sorry, CA power 1 adalah CA, right? Okay, so I, you don't put the one also is understandable sebab Anything yang kuasa satu adalah nombor itu balik. So, maksudnya 4 kuasa satu adalah 4. 4 kuasa kosong adalah 1. 4 kuasa satu adalah 4. Okay, so if you don't write the first kuasa satu pun is understandable sebab kita tahu adalah nombor itu kembali. But if you want to write down pun tak salah. Okay, right. So, katakanlah dia kata that reaction is first order with respect to B. So, you get minus Ra equals to KCB. So, that's why it's very important when we talk about reaction order, dia kena specific. Sebab bila kamu just say first order. Kalau dia satu reactant sahaja, tak apa. Kita dah terus faham sebab uh, reaction order merujuk kepada reactant. So, kalau satu reactant, katakan reactant A, then it's okay. Terus minus Ra equals to KCA. But you have two reactant, then the, the information must clearly mention first order with respect to A atau first order with respect to B. Okay, so, but you may ask, apa kepentingannya first order ini? Maksudnya, kalau saya nak menaikkan kadar tindak balas saya, saya nak lebih banyak A, lebih cepat A itu habis bertindak balas, I can do two things. One is I increase the value of K, sebab kamu tengok dia berkadar langsung kan. Kalau saya nak naikkan minus RA, saya kena naikkan nilai K saya. Okay, nanti kita akan, saya akan ajar kamu, macam mana kita naikkan nilai K? There are ways to increase the value of K. Okay, so then next one kamu tengok sekarang, Uh, kepekatan juga mempengaruhi. Means kalau saya increase kepekatan A, kadar tindak balas saya juga akan meningkat. So that's one thing that can manipulate my reactor. So this is why you learn reaction engineering. Daripada tindak balas tu, bila kamu tahu kadar tindak balas dia, kamu akan tahu apa yang kamu boleh buat. What can you do to increase the reaction rate? Okay, to increase more A being disappear in the reaction. Okay, so in this case, I increase concentration of A, I increase the value of K, my minus I will be increased. But for reaction, let's say reaction yang di mana the rate of reaction is given as KCB. Bermaksud, kalau saya nak lebih banyak A hilang, saya kena tingkatkan kepekatan B. 
Okay, so you must understand this concept juga. Tak semestinya kau naikkan keperkataan, nak naikkan kadar tindak balas A, saya kena naikkan keperkataan A. Katakan red law dia kata, minus RA equals to KCB, meaning that if I want to increase how much A disappear, I must increase the concentration of B dalam reaction saya. Okay, so that is the case kalau dia punya red law adalah minus RA equals to KCB. Okay, understand? Right, so. Maybe you will ask, uh, katakan dua reaktan, kenapa dia hanya merujuk kepada satu keperkataan saja? contohnya. Sebab ia bermaksud bahawa, katakanlah I have two reaktan A and B, right? But the rate law is minus RA equals to KCA. What happens to the CB? CB ada reaction order dia, tapi dia adalah zero order. Sebab tu CB kosong-kosong adalah satu. So, dia tak ada dah. Okay, maksudnya, kalau dia ada dua reaktan, tapi tetap tindak balas or the reaction order only refers to one reaktan, it means that the next reaktan tu, the second reaktan tu, tetap tindak balas dia adalah kosong. Ataupun maksudnya, untuk mempengaruhi kadar tindak balas ataupun berapa banyak A yang akan hilang dalam tindak balas, ia tak dipengaruhi oleh kepekatan reaktan itu. Okay, so that's why I said, reaction is complex in that sense that kamu kena betul-betul faham Tindak balas itu, macam mana kalau tindak balas dia akan berlaku, right? Okay, so in this case, you can see that kalau dia adalah first order reaction, okay, the rate of reaction will increase with the concentration of A. Kalau dia adalah KCA, dia akan uh, increase dengan kepekatan B kalau minus RA dia sama dengan KCB. Okay, so you understand now concept first order. Okay, next, you go second order. Okay, second order punya reaction also, okay, dia akan ada banyak uh, version. That's why you have to really understand. Why do I say that? Because when I say a second order overall reaction, okay, so, ataupun I just say second order reaction, first you have to tengok, reaction kamu tu ada berapa reactant. Kalau hanya satu reactant, okay, contohnya macam yang saya tunjukkan ini, katakan tindak balas kamu adalah satu reaktan sahaja dan yang saya kata adalah second order reaction definitely minus RA sama dengan KCA kuasa 2 definitely okay so katakan kamu ada satu reaktan sahaja bergantunglah macam mana tindak balas dia berlaku kalau dia kata hanya satu reaktan and it's only and dia kata two uh, second order reaction in this case Okay, it can be, uh, it definitely is minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. Sebab saya satu reactant, saya kata second order. However, when you have two reactant, this is where you have to be very careful. Bila saya ada dua reactant, reactant A, reactant B, dan saya kata dia adalah second order reaction, dia ada tiga possibility. Okay, sebab tu bila kamu, sometimes kamu baca jurnal atau kamu baca paper atau baca buku, That's it lah dia kata, untuk oxidation of nitrogen gas, the reaction is second order. You have to really understand, second order tu merujuk kepada reactant mana. So imagine I say ada tiga kemungkinan, right? Why? Okay, let's say your reactant is A and B, I say second order. So the first possibility, minus RA, uh, sorry, I give the order first, eh? Kalau I have reactant A, reactant B, second order, it can be, Second order with respect to A, zero order with respect to B. So, jadi minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. It can be zero order with respect to A, second order with respect to B. Kalau jantung dia akan menjadi minus RA. Kalau untuk kes yang macam tu, dia akan menjadi minus RA equals to KCB power of 2. Kalau saya repeat again, if they say the reaction is second order with respect to A and, sorry, zero order with respect to A, second order with respect to B, I will get the rate law as minus RA KCB power of 2. The third possibility, it can be first order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. Overall order is still second order. So the that rate law will be minus RA equals to KCACB. Okay, so that's why when we talk about order of the reaction, you must be very specific. We have to know very specific. Dia merujuk kepada kepekatan reaktan yang mana. So bila saya ada dua reaktan, dia adalah second order, saya kena tahu adakah dia second order towards A, zero order towards B. 
or zero order towards A, second order towards B, or first order towards A, first order towards B. So let's say kamu ada tiga tindak balas yang berbeza dan kesemua tiga ini adalah second order reaction, tak bermaksud rate law dia semua adalah sama. Dia boleh jadi ketiga-tiga dia ada rate law yang berbeza. So okay, to understand rate law adalah konsep dia macam IC tindak balas. Every specific reaction, dia ada minus RA dia yang tersendiri. You pun tak boleh assume until you have done the experimental work which I will teach you in chapter 5. How do you do the experimental work to determine the rate law? Okay, so apakah significance to know this, right? So maksudnya, katakanlah you want to, your reaction rate law is minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. Maksudnya, kalau saya nak tingkatkan kadar tindak balas A, uh, sorry, akan tindak balas A, correct, my concentration A has to be increased dua kali ganda. Okay, kamu kena increase dua kali ganda ke, 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 kepekatan A, baru minus RA kamu akan meningkat. Kamu tak payah kacau pun kepekatan B. Kalau kamu kacau kepekatan B, kamu naikkan kepekatan B pun, dia takkan mengacau kadar tindak balas kamu. Because your rate of reaction is only affected by concentration of A. Sama juga untuk katakanlah minus RA equals to KCB power of 2. Maksudnya, to increase the rate of reaction untuk A, saya kena kenaikkan keperkataan B sebanyak dua kali ganda. So imagine how much B has to be consumed baru saya boleh naikkan minus RA saya. So means I have to increase my concentration of B. Saya tak kacau pun concentration of A because I disturb A also it will not influence my rate of reaction. Okay so let's say your rate law is minus RA KCACB. For this case both concentration A dan B saya kena naikkan. Baru kadar tindak balas saya akan naik. Okay, so that is why the tricky part is understanding kadar tindak balas ni very specific to a reaction. So kita pun tak boleh sebarangan agak. We have to know the information clearly. Then you will use this to design the reactor. So that's why macam chapter 2. Senang sikit sebab minus RA itu diberi. Someone dah kira minus RA itu. Tapi chapter 3, sekarang kita kena kira sendiri. Okay, alright. So, that comes to the next question. How do we determine alpha and beta? Reaction order. Macam mana kita tahu dia zero order? Macam kita tahu dia first order? Macam mana kita tahu dia second order? Third order? Fourth order? So on and so forth. Okay, so until chapter 5 di mana kamu akan buat eksperimental. Kamu akan belajar cara eksperimental. Di chapter 3 pun we can already determine tetapi to determine it dia ada macam a little bit of ah uh, undang ucapan undang-undang a bit of guideline how do i determine okay so to determine the rate law ataupun to, to determine sorry to determine alpha dan beta dahulu maknanya reaction order ini adalah bergantung kepada mechanism tindak balas so you i think you have probably heard about mechanism of reaction okay so uh, dia merujuk kepada konsep molecularity so molecularity adalah bilangan atas atom, ion atau molekul yang terlibat dalam ataupun yang berlanggar semasa tindak balas itu. So, kamu kena faham macam mana kita tahu doktor katakanlah kadar tindak balas A itu adalah uh, KCA kuasa 2. Apa maksud dia? Okay, maksudnya dua atom atau dua ion atau dua molekul A will collide first Okay, dia harus collide sebab kamu tahu kan tindak balas yang berlaku bila you provide energy to the molecule, the molecule will collide with one another and then where the reaction will take place. So, they have to have enough energy untuk dia collide with one another baru tindak balas itu berlaku. Maksudnya, dia kena collide, interact baru tindak balas itu berlaku. So, bila saya kata dia adalah KCA kuasa 2, rate law dia. Maksudnya dia adalah dua molecule A atau dua ion A atau dua atom A yang berlanggar sama sendiri. They interact baru tindak balas berlaku. So let's say dia kata minus RA equals to KCACB. Maksudnya rate law dia macam mana A tu hilang adalah bila satu molecule atom atau ion A kena berlanggar dengan satu lagi atom ion atau molecule B. They collide, they interact tindak balas tu berlaku. So ini this collision, apa yang berlaku collision antara molekul apa dengan molekul apa yang menentukan kadar tindak balas dia. 
Okay, so kalau asid KCA kuasa 2, 2 molekul atau ion atau atom B. Uh, atom A, sorry. KCB kuasa 2, 2 atom B. Kalau KCA kuasa, uh, KCA CB, 1 atom A, 1 atom B. Kalau KCA, 1 atom A. KCB, 1 atom B. So on and so forth. Okay, right. So, bilangan atom yang berlanggar atau ion molekul, we call it either kalau unimolekular, 1 atom atau 1 molekul interact dan collide. Bimolekular adalah dua, termolekular adalah tiga. Ataupun berapa bilangan atom ion atau molekul yang harus collide dan interact untuk tindak balas itu berlaku yang menjadikan dia red law untuk tindak balas itu. So, maksudnya bukan sebarangan kita tentukan minus RE itu. Ini adalah daripada perlakuan tindak balas itu sendiri. Means kalau dia melibatkan collision of dua atom A sebab tu minus RE adalah KCA kuasa dua. Kalau dia melibatkan uh, collision of dua atom B sebab tu minus RE KCB kuasa dua. Melibatkan pelanggaran satu A, satu B. That's why become minus RA, KCA, CB. Okay, alright. Okay. However, okay, pelanggaran itu juga bergantung kepada tindak balas itu sendiri. Sebab kamu juga kena faham kita ada persamaan tindak balas. Right? Okay, persamaan tindak balas tu, dia, adalah, dia akan memberikan perkaitan. Contohnya lah, let's say the chemical equation says 1A react with 1B to produce 1C. Okay, stoichiometric tu mengatakan bahawa Perkadaran berkata bahawa 1A bertindak balas dengan 1B. Okay, so chemical equation tu sometimes tindak balas akan berlaku mengikut persamaan tindak balas kamu. Contohnya persamaan tindak balas kamu kata 1A bertindak balas dengan 1B menghasilkan 1C dan 1D. Maka tindak balas yang berlaku katakan dia mengikut perkadaran stoichiometric 1A bertindak balas dengan 1B maka kita boleh kata ia adalah minus RA equals to KCACB and we can say the reaction obeys elementary reaction maksudnya kalau kamu punya red law adalah uh, sorry the reaction order of your red law follows the stoichiometric coefficient we call it as elementary red law Okay, certain tindak balas, dia punya mekanism tindak balas dia. Macam saya kata, untuk kamu kira minus RA, dia bergantung kepada apa yang berlaku dalam tindak balas dia. Kalau uh, the, the collision that occurs is the same as the stoichiometric coefficient, dia punya tertip tu, kita panggil dia sebagai elementary rate law. Ataupun dalam arti kata yang the easiest to explain to you, if it's elementary rate law, if it's stated clearly, this reaction obeys elementary rate law, this reaction follows elementary rate law, the reaction order of the reactant follows the stoichiometric coefficient of the reactant in the chemical equation. Okay, contohnya katakan, you, uh, you are given the reaction 1A, 1B, produce 1C and 1D. Okay, so you can write the minus RA equals to K. K akan sentiasa ada regardless elementary ke non-elementary reaction. The K is still there. So it become kepekatan reactant. So ada dalam tindak balas saya ada dua reactant A dan B. So ada kepekatan reactant A, kepekatan reactant B. Tertip tindak balas dia, the order of reaction follows the stoichiometric coefficient. So it's 1A, 1B. So CA power of 1, CB pun power of 1. So as I mentioned, kuasa satu ni kalau kamu tak tulis pun is okay. Sebab anything kuasa satu menjadi balik benda itu. Empat kuasa satu adalah empat. Okay, sama. Tak tulis pun is okay. But if you want to write down to avoid confusion, you can also write. So again, I can only um, deduce ataupun I can conclude that the reaction order follows stoichiometric coefficient only and only if the reaction obeys elementary rate law. Maksudnya, daripada eksperimen yang dibuat, memang kita tahu bahawa the collision of the atom or the molecules is exactly according to the persamaan kimia. So maybe you ask, ada ke yang, kenapa ada yang tak ikut? Nanti I will explain later on. Tak semestinya masa dalam red law tu, maksudnya untuk meng mengira kadar kehilangan tu, collision tu tak semestinya mengikut perkadaran stoichiometric. Okay, that which we will learn later on, which we call it as non-elementary red law. Okay, so that is the part that you became a bit confused, I can understand.
But at this stage, kamu kena faham bila kamu tengok rate law, kamu kena baca maklumat yang pertama, dia adalah elementary ke non-elementary rate law. Kalau elementary, kamu dah tak payah fikir panjang, kamu just tengok persamaan kimia dia, ambil kepekatan reaktan dia, kuasa dia ikut stoichiometric coefficient dalam persamaan kimia dia. Okay, contohnya lah, the second reaction. 2NO react with oxygen gas to produce 2NO2. Okay, so nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so rate law dia, okay, the rate of disappearance of nitrogen oxide, nitrous oxide equals to K. Ambil kepekatan reaktan kamu, so nitrogen, ke, uh, CNO and CO2. So second order with respect to NO and First order with respect to O2 sebab tindak balas ialah 2NO bertindak balas dengan 1O2. Maksudnya the reaction will be second order with respect to NO, first order with respect to O2. Second order with respect to nitrogen oxide, first order with respect to oxygen gas. That's why you get the rate law KCNO power of 2, CO2 power of 1. Okay, so bila the elementary rate law, you don't have to think that much. Okay, I'll, I will write down the minus Ra or the minus of the reactant equals to K. You put down the concentration of the reactant. The reaction order follows the stoichiometry coefficient in your chemical equation. Okay, so that is for elementary reaction. So contohnya, as this is what I teach you just now. Let's say tindak balas kamu adalah A menghasilkan B dan rate law dia adalah minus RA equals to KCA. Maksudnya, kadar kehilangan A bergantung kepada the collision and interaction of only one molecule atom atau ion A. That's why kita panggil dia unimolecular one. Okay, but let's say your reaction is 2A produce B and dia punya rate law minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. It means in the reaction, bila kita nak mengira kadar kehilangan A, dia lah bersamaan dengan dalam tindak balas dia, dua atom ion atau molecule A collide, interact with one another supaya tindak balas tu berlaku, we call it bimolecular. Let's say reaction dia, A tambah B menghasilkan C dan D. Okay, then rate law dia, minus RA, K, C, A, C, B. So, this is all elementary rate law, right? So, kamu just ikut saja persamaan tindak balas. So, untuk tindak balas ni, maksud satu atom ion molecule A ber ber collide and interact dengan satu lagi atom ion molecule B. Supaya tindak balas tu berlaku, we call it again by molecular. By refers to two, uni refers to one. Okay, the last one, which is very rarely, I would say, tak uh, rare but can happen. Let's say 2A react with 1B to produce C and D. So in this reaction, uh, it can be two molecule atom or ion A collide with one atom ion or molecule of B. So this one three atom, right? Three atom ion or molecule. We call it as thermocular three. So dia boleh berlaku although I would say quite rare sebab untuk melibatkan, kamu bayangkan nak tahu kadar kehilangan A, dia kena tiga atom ion molecule yang kena collide in one another. So, I would probably deduce this is quite a uh, hard reaction to occur. Okay, right. However, okay, as I said, reaction ada elementary, non-elementary. Okay, elementary adalah di mana tertib tindak balas mengikut Persamaan stoichiometric coefficient. Ikut, kamu tengok saja nombor di hadapan reaktan itu, itulah tertib tindak balas dia. But for non-elementary, this is no longer applicable. Itu jadi masalah dia. Reaction ada yang ikut elementary, ada yang tak ikut. So, kenapa dia yang tak ikut? Okay, sometimes dalam tindak balas, I hope I don't get you confused, okay. Sometimes certain reaction, walaupun kamu tengok persamaan kimia dia, you may see the reaction, uh, the reaction uh, equation. Contohnya dalam kes ni, contoh kamu tengok di atas ni, eh, persamaan tindak balas dia adalah NO2 tindak balas dengan CO menghasilkan NO dan CO2, nitrous, nitrous oxide react with carbon monoxide and eh, sorry nitrous dioxide react with carbon monoxide to produce nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide 
Okay. Itu adalah persamaan kimia dia. Tapi kamu kena faham. Apabila tindak balas tu berlaku, dia tak semestinya hanya satu tindak balas pada waktu yang sama. Sometimes in one chemical equation yang sebenarnya berlaku melibatkan series of reaction. Sebab tu kita panggil dia mechanism. Maksudnya untuk satu tindak balas yang atas tu terjadi, dia melibatkan beberapa tindak balas untuk berlaku dahulu baru ia boleh berlaku. Contohnya in this reaction, Kadar yang pertama adalah NO2 ni bertindak balas dulu dengan satu lagi NO2 untuk menghasilkan NO3 dan NO. So maksudnya dia bukan direct kalau kami masukkan NO2 tu dia akan tindak balas dengan CO. Tak. NO2 tu akan bertindak balas dulu dengan satu lagi NO2 untuk menghasilkan NO3 dan NO. So, tindak balas tu pertama tu akan ada rate law dia sendiri. So, kamu kena faham bila ada satu tindak balas besar tapi dalam tindak balas yang sebenar berlaku lebih daripada satu tindak balas, setiap satu tindak balas tu ada rate law dia yang tersendiri. Sebab tu dia jadi kompleks. You assume only one reaction occurs. Not necessarily. Okay. So, katakanlah in contoh kes ni, itu adalah step pertama. NO2 tindak balas dulu dengan NO2 menghasilkan NO3 dan NO. Dan Baru terjadi tindak balas yang kedua di mana NO3 saya akan bertindak balas dengan CO untuk menghasilkan NO2 dan CO2. Maksudnya tindak balas kedua itu baru menghasilkan produk yang saya nak. Okay, so apabila tindak balas baru tindak balas yang kedua tu berlaku, maka akan ada pula rate law yang kedua sebab dia adalah dua, it's basically two separate reaction under one main reaction. So, tindak balas kedua tu ada rate law dia. Contohnya jadi K2, CNO3, CCO. Okay, so again, rate law ni adalah someone has determined lah tindak balas pertama berapa rate law dia. Tindak balas kedua adalah berapa rate law dia. Okay, so you may ask, Apabila terjadi lebih daripada satu tindak balas pada masa yang, uh, bukan masa yang sama. Dia boleh jadi pada masa yang sama, dia boleh jadi tindak balas yang bersiri. Apa maksud dia? Maksudnya adalah, dia bergantung kepada, katakanlah dalam satu tindak balas utama, saya ada dua tindak balas sampingan, dia bergantung kepada tindak balas mana yang lebih cepat, mana yang lebih lambat. Tindak balas yang lebih cepat tu akan berlaku dahulu, tindak balas yang berlambat tu akan berlaku kemudian. Okay, so that I mean, mean that. I may have more than one reaction occurring at the same time and these two separate reaction dia ada kadar dia tersendiri. So tindak balas yang lebih cepat akan berlaku dahulu. Tindak balas yang lebih lambat mungkin berlaku kemudian. It depends. Okay. So contoh dalam kes ini, dia kata it determine that step one is slow but step two is fast. Okay. So bila saya ada dua tindak balas, You may ask then, macam mana kita nak tahu kadar tindak balas kita? Mana SRE kita berdasar yang kepada yang mana? Mana SRE kita akan berdasarkan kepada tindak balas yang perlahan itu? So, maksudnya mana SRE for my reaction is based on that one particular reaction yang berlaku perlahan dulu. Sebab that is what we call as rate determining step. Okay, okay. again, I repeat, I hope you understand. But kalau tak pampu, okay je. Just that at least you get some idea kenapa kadang-kadang rate law dia tak ikut stoichiometric coefficient. Okay, ini adalah case di mana bila lebih daripada satu tindak balas berlaku pada waktu, ah uh, lebih, sorry, more than one reaction occurs at that one time. Okay, so bila lebih daripada satu tindak balas berlaku, kita panggil dia mechanism sebenarnya. Okay, so setiap reaction yang berlaku tu, Okay, ataupun kita panggil tindak balas sampingan. Setiap tindak balas tu ada rate law dia tersendiri. Okay, salah satu daripada rate law itu akan menjadi rate law untuk keseluruhan tindak balas. So, rate law yang biasa kita akan pilih adalah rate law untuk tindak balas sampingan yang perlahan. Kita panggil dia rate determining step. So, rate law untuk rate determining step tu menjadi rate law untuk keseluruhan reaction. So, contoh dalam kes ini. Dia kata tindak balas pertama ni yang lambat. Okay, so therefore it becomes the rate law for the entire reaction. Right, okay. So if I recap back, okay, just to avoid your confusion. If let's say dia adalah non-elementary rate law, maksudnya the reaction order dah tak ikut stoichiometric coefficient. 
Itu saja dia punya penerangan yang paling senang. Kalau elementary rate law, if the reaction obeys elementary rate law, reaction order dia follow stoichiometric coefficient. Non elementary rate law, dia punya tertib tindak balas, the reaction order does not follow the stoichiometric coefficient. So the question will be, then macam ni kita nak tahu kalau kita dah tak boleh tengok persamaan tindak balas, right? For that kind of information, If it's in test or exam, I will tell you clearly. Apakah dia punya tertib tindak balas dia? Sebab kamu dah tak boleh agak daripada persamaan tindak balas. Okay, kalau elementary kamu boleh tengok persamaan tindak balas. Non elementary kamu dah tak boleh tengok sebab dia dah tak ikut. So, I will provide you with the information. If let's say for your mini project or let's say in real application, what you need to do? You need to find out from literature, from books. Okay, katakan your reaction is oxidation of nitrogen gas. Okay, kamu google. What is the rate law for oxidation of nitrogen gas? Ataupun nama tindak balas itu, someone has already determined that rate law. Kamu ikut saja rate law yang dia bagi. Just that, remember, kalau not elementary, kamu dah tak boleh agak daripada stoichiometric coefficient dalam persamaan tindak balas. Okay, contohnya kan? Okay. Let's say the reaction A plus B equals to C plus D. Okay. And they say this is, this reaction follows non-elementary rate law. Okay, again they say the reaction follows non-elementary rate law. Okay, so rate law dia kamu dah tak boleh agak, kamu dah tak boleh tengok persamaan tindak balas, the information will be given to you. For example, let's say I read, I write in the test, the reaction is first order with respect to A. So you just write minus RA equals to KCA. Let's say I say the reaction is second order with respect to A minus RA equals to KCA cos 2. Or I say the reaction is first order with respect to B minus RA equals to KCB. So maksudnya non-elementary information tu diberi. Kamu tak payah bimbang. Kalau elementary, kalau contohnya kes ini di mana dia adalah elementary maka minus RA Sorry eh, saya, saya saya tak bawa pen untuk tulis ni. So, it become K equals to CA power of 1, CB power of 1. So, how do I get CA power 1, CB power 1? Because based on the rate of, based on the chemical equation, is 1A, 1B. So, first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. That is only and only if reaction tu adalah follows elementary rate law. Kalau non-elementary rate law, I will provide you with the information. So next one, example. 2NO react with O2 to produce 2NO2. So kalau dia adalah elementary rate law, if it's elementary rate law, minus RA dia akan jadi sama dengan K sorry, CA kita assume ni A eh. Okay, sorry, saya kena letak A, B, C, D. Nanti kamu confused. Okay, I put C. 2A plus 1B produce 2C. Okay, sebab real reaction is easier if we write down in the form of A, B, C, right? So, the reaction is 2A, 1B, 2C. So, if it's elementary rate law, the rate law will be minus RA equals to KCA power of 2, second order with respect to A because there's a number 2 in front of your A and we have CB power of 1 because in front of O2 is only 1. So that is elementary rate law. If non-elementary rate law, I will provide you with information. For example, I say it is a second order with respect to A. Zero order with respect to B. So minus, NO, minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. If I say it's first order with respect to A and zero order with respect to B, then I get minus RA equals to KCA. So on and so forth. So maksudnya, konsep paling senang, elementary, tengok persamaan tindak balas. Non-elementary information has to be given to you. Okay, so that's the important part of this lesson. So example, next example. Contohnya, the same reaction kiri dan kanan. A plus 2B produce 2C. So kalau dia adalah elementary rate law, the reaction will be minus RA equals to K. CA power of 1 because in front of A in the chemical equation is 1. 
first order with respect to A and second order with respect to B. So, K, C, A, C, B, power of 2. Kalau dia adalah non-elementary rate law and stated second order with respect to A, zero order with respect to B. So, dia dah kata non-elementary dan dia beri kamu rate law dia second order with respect to A, zero order with respect to B. Maksudnya, tindak balas dia adalah rate of the reaction is minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. So, apa masuk ayat ni? Okay, untuk memahami tindak pasti bermaksud, untuk tindak balas A menghasilkan B untuk menghasilkan C, tindak balas yang perlahan yang berlaku dahulu adalah <coughs> maksudnya untuk tindak balas ni tindak balas pertama yang berlaku adalah kedua-dua A tu patut kedua-dua itu kena collide and react dahulu baru dia akan bergabung dengan B. So gabungan dengan B tu adalah tindak balas yang cepat. The collation of the A tu yang tindak balas yang lambat. Sebab tu dia menjadi rate law untuk tindak balas itu. So that is how you interpret why the rate law dia tak ikut stoichiometric coefficient. Sebab lebih daripada satu tindak balas berlaku and more of that one reaction is the slow reaction. It becomes the rate law for the reaction. Okay. So I will have, I will take a five minute break. Macam biasalah, physical class. Saya rasa pun duduk depan komputer sejam pun saya rasa um, quite tiring for you. So, I give you five minute break. You can take a little bit of break. Okay, I will continue in five minutes time. Okay, so I will come back in five minutes time. All right.
Okay, so we are back for the next part of the lesson. All right, so hopefully so far you're still okay. Uh, I have to admit it's a bit difficult. It's really difficult even if online. Uh, I think face-to-face -face pun dah susah sebenarnya. Online is a little bit at the challenge, but hopefully later on you check the notes. I think you will understand better with the notes lah later on if you have time. Okay, right. So next, next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we have determined the rate law. Okay, we have learned about the rate law. How do we determine? Dia adalah elementary ke, non-elementary to determine the reaction order. Adakah dia first order ke, second order ke, zero order ke? And macam mana, how do we determine the order of the reaction? So as I mentioned, it depends on elementary, non-elementary reaction. Kalau elementary, tengok persamaan kimia. You look at the chemical equation. You check the stoichiometric coefficient. If not elementary, the information given to you. Okay, so next, we learn about value of K. Okay, so value of K, K is the reaction rate constant. Tadi kalau ingat saya katakan, kalau kita nak menaikkan, kalau tindak balas, uh, kalau tindak balas, minus RA, we can, also, we can do this by increasing the value of K. So now we have to understand apa tu K and how do we uh, determine the value of K and how can we manipulate the value of K. So K tu adalah nombor eh. Alright, so first of all, Uh, before we learn more about K, we have to also learn first the unit of K. So you may wonder, kenapa lah kena baca pasal unit, right? Okay, I will explain. Okay, first of all, unit K is will not be the same. Okay, maksudnya, kalau saya ada tindak balas yang berbeza, rate law yang berbeza, particularly because of the rate law, kalau rate law dia berbeza, Bila saya cakap rate law maksudnya minus RA, I have different rate law, different minus RA, unit K itu pun akan jadi unit yang berlainan. And it's important to know the unit of K. So why? Okay, so first of all, let us explain kenapa unit dia boleh berbeza mengikut rate law. When I say rate law, basically it's because of the reaction order. Okay, so let us address the common Uh, reaction order dulu. Okay, so let's say katakan tindak balas dia adalah zero order, which is maksudnya minus RA equals to K. Okay, Mas bila dia jadi macam ni, right. On your left hand side, minus RA. So minus RA ini, dia punya unit dan dimension sentiasa sama. Regardless rate law kosong, zero order re reaction ke, first order reaction ke, second order reaction. Minus RA, unit dan dimension dia sentiasa sama which is concentration over time. Minus RA. Sebab tu kalau kamu tengok unit minus RA, dia biasanya contohnya lah eh, mol per dm cube minit, mol per liter saat, so on and so forth. Tapi dia masih concentration per time. So kalau belah kiri kamu concentration per time and zero order minus RA equals to K, therefore your unit and dimension of K is the same as minus RA. So dia akan menjadi uh, concentration per time juga. Maka for zero order reaction, unit K dan dimension K adalah concentration per time. So contohnya I can write let's say mole per dm cube okay let's say second okay unit dia sentiasa akan sama okay contohnya lah eh, tak semestinya maksudnya bukanlah semestinya mesti mol per dm cube second dia menjadi mol per liter minit mol per liter hour uh, pound mol per feet cube hour okay Dimension tu akan sama. Unit tu bergantung lah kan kamu guna. Sebab katakanlah volume dia ada unit dm cube, ada liter, ada feet cube right? But the dimension is still the same. Mole per liter volume ataupun concentration per time. Okay now. Kalau dia adalah first order reaction. Katakan. So first order tu boleh jadi minus RA equals to KCA. Dia boleh jadi juga minus RA equals to KCB. Either one pun. Let us check the dimension and unit of K. So as mentioned, belah kiri masih concentration per time. Minus RA tu sentiasa concentration per time. Kenapa? Kan saya katakan kita pernah belajar. What is minus RA? Berapa banyak 
kehilangan keperkataan A terhadap masa kan? Sebab tu dia jadi keperkataan pemasa. Keperkataan tu merujuk pada keperkataan A yang hilang untuk satu unit masa itu. So unit mana rasa A sentiasa sama. But on your left hand, uh, on your right hand side, sorry tadi left ni right. Okay, on your right hand side, okay, unit K tu kita nak cari, kita biarkan. And kita sekarang dah ada CA. CA tu adalah keperkataan, remember? CA is concentration, right? So when you batalkan, kamu akan dapat dimension untuk K adalah satu per masa. Ataupun arti kata lain, unit K will be per time. Per minute, per hour, per second, per day. So you can see now, unit K tu dah berubah kan? Kalau tadi zero order, it can be mole per dm cube hour, mole per liter second. Tapi kalau dia first order, dia jadi per hour, per second, per minute. Contohnya 10 per second. Ha, 20 per hour. Itu adalah unit untuk K kalau dia adalah first order. Kalau zero order, unit dia lain. Okay. Let us try second order. Okay. I will explain later on. Kenapa kita kena tahu eh. Just first first kita determine first. Kenapa unit dia boleh berbeza. Okay. For second order, dia boleh jadi minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. It can be minus RA KCB power of 2. It can be minus RA equals to KCA CB. All three scenarios are still second order. Okay. Overall order dia. Right. Okay. So, let us check what will be the dimension for K. Okay. So, sebelah kiri again concentration per time. Okay. Sebelah kiri tak pernah berubah. Sebab tu unit K berubah. Sebab unit kiri tak berubah. Unit kanan tu yang akan berubah. Right. Okay. So, concentration sekarang menjadi kuasa 2. CA kuasa 2. Concentration kuasa 2. CB kuasa 2. Concentration kuasa 2. CA, CB. Also, concentration multiply with concentration is still concentration power of 2. So, you get when you do the unit cancellation, sorry, when you do the unit cancellation or dimension cancellation, you get your dimension of K sekarang 1 per concentration time. Ah, Contoh unit dia is for example, dm cube, dm cube per mole second. Dia sekarang dah jadi satu per concentration time kan. Concentration kan mole per dm cube. Kalau satu per concentration, mole di bawah dm cube di atas. right? So jadi let's say dm cube per mole second. Liter per mole hour. Feet cube per pound mole minute. So on and so forth. So kamu tengok. The unit of K will change according to the reaction order. Okay so now that you understand why the unit changes, it comes to the second question. Why do we need to know that? This is a good question. It's because that. Let's see. You are finding from journal. Okay. You do not, the information does not give you the rate law. Dia tak beritahu kamu. Reaction tu first order with respect to A ke, first order with respect to B ke, second order ke, zero order. Dia tak bagi tahu information ini. But, they give you the value of K with the unit. So let's say you get, they give you the value of K from the paper is let's say 10 per second. So it tells you reaction tu adalah first order reaction. Katakan lebih tahu dari journal, the reaction is 10 dm cube per mole second. It tells you the reaction is second order. Let's say they say 10 mole per dm cube minute. The reaction is zero order. However, to deduce more is, is depending on the reactant. Maksudnya lah kan, if reaction tu adalah satu reactant sahaja. Okay, only one reactant, reactant A. So let's say if they say the reaction is 10 per second, you know it's first order, it's definitely first order with respect to A. So minus RA equals to KCA. Let's say the reaction says, the, paper, the journal or the book or the paper says, the reaction rate constant nilai K itu adalah 10 dm cube per second and the reaction is only one reactant A. You can definitely know that the rate law is minus RA equals to KCA power of 2. However, if you have two reactant, then kamu dah tak boleh deduce accurately. Kalau kamu ada reactant A, reactant B, kamu dah tak boleh deduce accurately. Kenapa? Katakan reactant kamu adalah 
1 a bertin a bertindak balas dengan b then kamu baca pada jurnal dia kata uh, nilai k 10 per saat 10 per second you know is first order but you are you still do not know first order with respect to a or first order with respect to b kedua-duanya pun first order tapi dia merujuk kepada keperkataan a ke keperkataan tu same example let's say dia adalah 1a react with 1b and they says the value of k is 10 dm cube per second so you know this is second order reaction confirm tapi you still do not know the reaction order with respect to the reactant sebab second order tu boleh menjadi second order with respect to a so minus ra kca power of 2 it can be second order with respect to B. So minus RA, KCB, power of 2. It can also be first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. Minus RA equals to KCACB. So in this case, you know it's a second order, but you still cannot deduce accurately the rate law ataupun the reaction order with respect to the reactants. If you have more than one reactant. So the information is powerful in some sense, applicable if you have one reactant. If more than one reactant, is not the information is not enough yet for you to deduce correctly the rate law. Okay, so that's the purpose of this slide to, to explain to you about that. Okay, so we go to the next one. Okay, sebab kita sekarang kita belum lagi kira macam mana kita nak tahu nilai K. Okay, so the K Okay, as mentioned, reaction rate constant. Okay, so or sometimes we call it specific reaction rate. So these two, uh, we call it sometimes reaction rate constant. Kadang-kadang kita panggil dia specific reaction rate. And the value of K is dependent on temperature. Or I can say clearly, nilai K bergantung atau berubah dengan suhu. Maksudnya, kalau kamu ubah suhu tindak balas, nilai K berubah, nilai K berubah, nilai minus RA pun berubah. Ingat, I told you, right? You can manipulate minus RA, you can increase minus RA by manipulating the value of K. Now, you learn the value of K can be manipulated through temperature. Or, you can also manipulate if you use catalyst. Sebab tu kadang-kadang orang guna catalyst. We want to manipulate the value of K. Seboleh-bolehnya, the best, I want to increase K so that my minus RA increase. Or sometimes, you can also change the pressure, the total pressure if it's gas phase reaction. Or it can be parameter of other properties such as ionic strength and solvent kalau liquid system. Okay, tapi case 1, uh, sorry, case 2, 3 and 4, this is not something that we will go further. Catalyst later on dalam chapter 8, kita akan yang fokus terhadap kesan suhu. How do we increase the value of K through change of temperature? Okay, this can be explained through an equation. So now you see you have learned another equation. Okay, so this equation, we call it as Arrhenius equation. So this equation is very familiar, very famous untuk tindak balas. Dalam tindak balas or in reaction engineering, if you say Arrhenius equation, memang 10 orang, 10 orang akan tahulah if you have learned reaction engineering. This equation is very famous. Okay, so why you call it Arrhenius equation? The person who discovered this equation is called Arrhenius. So this equation was uh, elucidated at 1912. So imagine dah berapa tahun, hampir 100 tahun, lebih daripada 100 tahun, dah equation ini, someone has already come up with the correlation. So remember I told you, I said that, K changes with temperature, right? You can see from the equation. Reaction rate constant, before I forget, you don't have to memorize this equation. You are provided, but you have to understand. Okay, so the value of K is given as equal to A. So A is what we call as pre-exponential factor or frequency factor. Okay, so this is uh, pemala, kita panggil this sebagai Factor, frequency factor atau pre-exponential factor. Okay, so it's given as A. So I can understand. Kalau lagi satu simbol baru yang kamu kena belajar kan. So I can understand it's a bit hard. In the sense that 
asyik-asyik muncul benda baru. So imagine I my course dah ada banyak simbol. You have another four or five courses all also got its own symbol. I can understand. So tu saya kata nanti bila nak dekat dengan test, especially the week after yang you back physically, please attend class. I will do practice question for your test. So I will go to class, we will, we will have some practice question we will do together to prepare you for the test so that at least you know somewhat what you need to focus for the test. Okay, so at this stage kalau macam tak faham sangat, okay, don't worry. But minggu yang dah balik physical to campus, please make sure you come. I will give you practice question. We will do together. Then you will somewhat understand better and at least kamu tahu apa nak fokus untuk kamu punya test. Okay? Right. Especially saya tahu minggu tujuh ada banyak test. So I will try to help you in that sense. Kita fokus terus kepada apa yang kamu kena faham untuk test itu. Right. Okay. Come back to here. Eh? Okay. So the question is given K equals to A. Exponential. Exponential you know, right? In bracket minus negative is there ea per rt so remember i said k is influenced by temperature right that's why there's a t here so maksudnya if you see the correlation to increase the value of k my temperature must increase as well sebab tu kalau kamu in, kalau kamu perasan sometimes if the reaction is slow or the reaction is not occurring kita akan panaskan tindak balas itu so you may ask mungkin you don't you may wonder kenapa kita panaskan tindak balas bila kita panaskan tindak balas kita naikkan suhu Bila kita naikkan suhu, kamu tengok nilai K akan naik. Kan tadi kamu ingat rate law minus RA equals to K, right? Temperature increase, K increase, minus RA pun increase. Minus RA is what? The concentration of A yang hilang semasa tindak balas. So, bila saya panaskan, nilai K pun naik, minus RA pun akan naik. So, tu, that is the engineering side of why we heat up our reaction if it's too slow. To increase the temperature, to increase the value of K, to increase the minus RA. Okay, so this equation says that, okay, EA ni adalah activation energy. I will teach you later on. I will itu maksud activation energy. So, but the gist is energy, you need dia mesti joule per mole atau calorie per mole. You know, right? The unit energy yang common is joule and calorie, right? So, EA unit dia adalah joule per mole atau calorie per mole. Okay. Macam kita nak tahu dia joule per mole atau kalori per mole bergantung kepada unit gas constant. The R value that you use, it depends on the unit of the R value. Okay, untuk Arrhenius equation, nilai R yang kita gunakan hanya dua sahaja which is provided to you which is either 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin or 1.987 calorie per mole Kelvin. So, kalau kamu guna gas constant R, 8.314 def, uh, joule per mole Kelvin, your EA will be in joule per mole. If you use 1.987 calorie per mole Kelvin, therefore your EA will be in calorie per mole. So it depends what R that I use we determine the EA unit that you will have. Okay, next one, temperature. Because our R value is in Kelvin, ada unit R, sorry, R value kita unit dia Kelvin, right? So that's why the temperature unit must be Kelvin as well. Kamu dah belajar kan CPP kan unit Untuk pembatalan unit, unit itu kena konsisten unit yang sama, right? So, kalau R value saya, unit dia adalah Kelvin. Temperature dia, saya kenalah convert ke dalam Kelvin if it's not given in Kelvin. And also, the unit of your A will be equal to the unit of your K. So, why this happen? Okay, kalau you learn in CPP, you learn about unit, right? Okay, you can see at the back part, dia adalah exponential. Okay, cuba kau tengok dalam kurungan ini, katakanlah saya letak EA as joule per mole. Okay, katakan saya guna unit joule per mole. Okay, okay, divide by unit R saya adalah joule per mole Kelvin. Okay, joule per mole Kelvin for my R. Okay, lepas tu darab dengan T saya pun Kelvin. So, you can see I can cancel. Kelvin cancel dengan Kelvin. Joule per mole cancel dengan atas joule per mole. Maksudnya, dalam bracket ini, dia adalah dimensionless atau unitless. So, you may ask, why? 
Kami ingat di hadapan bracket tu adalah eksponen. Kita takkan ada eksponen unit. Kamu tak pernah dengar kan? Eksponen kilogram, eksponen liter, eksponen mililiter, eksponen dm3. Tak ada. Tak ada unit yang dieksponenkan. You cannot do that. That's why in the bracket it will be dimensionless and unitless. Sebab tu unit A mestilah sama dengan unit K. Since the back part is already that unitless, therefore unit A sama dengan unit K. Okay, so that is satu that you have to understand. Kenapa unit K sama dengan unit A? Tapi I'm very sure you have learned this in CPP. First, last time we, I taught CPP before, this was on the example yang we all always use to make student understand. Bagaimana kadang-kadang kenapa setengah Unit itu kena jadi unitless atau dimensionless. Sebab exponential, dia tak boleh exponential unit. Dia tak boleh exponential dimension. Okay, alright. Now, let me explain on activation energy. Sebab dalam kita punya Arrhenius equation, we got Ea. Okay, what is Ea? So, we call it as activation energy. So, what is activation energy? Okay, you must understand that. For a reaction to occur, katakanlah you have reactant A with reactant B. For the reaction to occur, for A and B to react to produce C, reactant A and B too must have enough energy in them before the reaction can take place. If they don't have that enough energy, the reaction can never take place. And that minimum amount of energy is what we call as activation energy, Ea. Sebab tu kamu lakukan kamu tengok, katakanlah in your reactor, okay? Atau tu kamu letak, katakanlah FYP lah, kamu kamu buat reaction dalam beaker, okay? In the beaker, you put A, you put B, you realize nothing happen. The reaction does not occur. What does it mean? Means both reactant tu tak ada cukup tenaga. Dia ada, mesti ada minimum tenaga yang diperlukan untuk kedua reactant ini baru tindak balas boleh berlaku. Meaning let's say lah, activation energy for this reaction is 100 kilojoule per mole. Selagi A dan B awak kamu, if your A and B still doesn't have enough 100 kilojoule per mole, the reaction can never occur. So what do you do? That's why you remember, Sometimes we heat up the reactant. So why do we heat up? We provide energy to the reactant. So we provide energy with the hope that it is sufficient to reach 100 kJ per mole. Then only the reaction occurs. Sebab tu kamu dah boleh faham kenapa certain tindak balas memerlukan pemanasan. It's because we are providing energy to the mixture until it reach its activation energy. Then only the reaction can occur. Sebab tu, sometimes you can imagine how do you determine reaction yang baik atau tidak baik. Kalau reaction tu has low activation energy, we can deduce yang tindak balas ni lebih mudah berlaku kalau activation energy dia adalah lebih rendah. It's the same like, let's say you compare to react to reaction, it's like you compare climbing, I always give this very easy example, you, you compare climbing Bukit Tampin dengan Kinabalu, Gunung Kinabalu, you can assume it's easier to climb Bukit Tampin daripada Kinabalu Mountain, right? Because Bukit, Tam, Bukit Tampin, Bukit Tampin, pula. Bukit Tampin has a lower height in terms of uh, Bukit Tampin maybe tak sampai 2,000 meter kot. Uh, Kinabalu is 4,000 meter, right? So, of course, it's easier to climb Bukit Tampin compared to Kinabalu Mountain. It's the same like reaction. If I have a lower tension energy, that reaction will occur easier compared to the reaction that has higher activation energy. So if you are uh, dealing with a reaction that has high activation energy, very likely you have to heat up or supply heat to the reaction, then only the reaction can occur. Then if you remember I mentioned about uh, K is also influenced by catalyst, right? So how does catalyst influence? When you use catalyst, you will offer another pathway di mana the activation energy become lower. Sebab tu sometimes certain reaction akan guna mungkin sebab mungkin ni akan membantu untuk mengurangkan activation energy dia. Kalau the activation energy is lower, the reaction can occur easier. So sometimes that's why we use catalyst. We lower down the activation energy, the reaction can occur easier. Okay, so that's the concept of Arrhenius equation. The value of K 
activation energy and the effect of temperature towards your reaction. Okay, so this is to check your understanding, to calculate okay, the value of K at 70 Celsius. So this is just to practice. Lah. How do we determine the value of K if we have uh, the information given here? Okay, so let's say, let's say the reaction A and B react to form C. Activation energy 3 kJ per mole. So this is your EA. So now you have learned EA is your activation energy. Okay, and pre-exponential factor of 0 0.5. So, this is your A. So, dia bagi kamu EA, dia bagi kamu A. Dia suruh kamu kira reaction rate constant K. Temperature kamu adalah 70 Celsius. So, this is your T. Okay, so this is information given to you. Therefore, you can calculate using Arrhenius equation. So, K at 70 Celsius equals to e uh, equals to a your pre exponential factor 0 0.5 exponential exponential to i hope you know how to use your calculator to get exponential minus negative ea per rt okay then now first challenge is make sure you know which r you want to use if your ea is in kilojoule or joule specifically then you will use 8.314. Kalau dia calorie, you will use 1.987. Because 1.987 calorie per mole Kelvin. Kalau 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. Okay, so you write down 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. EA, you don't forget, your R is joule. Your EA is given in kilojoule. So kalau dia berikan kilojoule, convert into joule you multiply with 1000 you know right 1 kilo joule 1000 eh, sorry 1 kilo joule 1000 joule so kalau 3 kilo joule 3000 joule so you convert from kilo joule to joule so your ea don't forget the negative sign because the formula is k equals to a exponential minus ea per rt okay then your p your in temperature unit in your R is Kelvin. So your temperature unit in the question given in Celsius, you have to convert into Kelvin by adding 273.15. You have learned this, right? To convert Celsius to Kelvin, I just add 273.15. Therefore, you can get the value of your K. I did not give you the final answer. I would like you to try by yourself later on when you have uh, time and you have, if you want to trust, test, uh, try. You want to test by yourself if you understand the calculation, you can calculate to determine your value of your K here. Okay, this example. All right. Okay, next one. Let's think of for banyak lagi so that I know where to stop because I do not want to too much. Okay, right, okay, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, now, next part. Okay, this Arrhenius equation, yang tadi yang you learn, K equals to A, exponential minus EA per RT, that Arrhenius equation has two version. Tadi version pertama yang kita baru belajar, di mana K, I will write down first, because I, I worry that you get confused. So, version pertama yang kamu belajar, the original version, K equals to A, sorry tau, it's, my handwriting is really bad because I'm using mouse. K minus EA, I should be using the pen. Minus EA per RT. So, this was the original equation that you learned. K equals to A exponential minus EA per RT. That equation, Arrhenius equation, dia ada version yang kedua. Both version pun provided to you. Okay, so what's the difference? Okay, in the first version, in order for you to find K, kamu kena tahu A, E, E. R dan R. R gas constant dah pernah dah tahu lah kan? Okay, temperature. Tapi yang penting, kamu kena tahu A dengan E, E. Kalau tak ada A dengan E, E, kamu tak boleh solve version yang pertama. Now we have second version of the equation di mana kamu tak perlukan E. Kamu tak tahu E pun kamu boleh kira. Tetapi is for certain scenario only. What scenario is that? Okay, let's say lah. Okay, you understand that I say K changes with temperature. Okay, let's say lah. Okay, 
you learn from literature. Okay, again, uh, for those who wonders, how do we determine K? Biasanya, again, kalau dia adalah tindak balas yang biasa dah orang buat, ataupun it's a common reaction, someone already found out A and E A for you. So, kalau kamu dah tahu A, E, A, kamu terus boleh kira. Maksudnya K, kamu tahu temperature kamu, kamu tahu A and E, A from literature, you can already calculate K. But let's say, you don't know A and you do not know the value of A. However, let's say for literature, you found out that kamu tahu nilai K pada suhu tertentu. Contohnya, baca pada literature, pada suhu 50 Celsius, nilai K dia adalah 4. Empat per saat, let's say. Okay, sekarang, kamu nak tahu pada suhu kamu, katakanlah suhu kamu adalah, sorry, tadi saya kata nilai K empat per second kalau temperature dia 50 Celsius. Katakan kamu nak tahu nilai K apabila suhu dia adalah 80 Celsius. How do I know? Without knowing the value of A. Tetapi kamu tahu EA. EA ni kena kena tahu. Both version needs me to know EA. But one version, original version needs me to know A. The second version doesn't need me to know A. Tetapi in, I need to know nilai K pada satu suhu yang lain. Dan saya nak cari nilai K saya pada suhu yang baru. Maksudnya if I know K1 at T1. I know EA, I want to find my new K at my new temperature. How do I find it? Okay, so maksudnya version kedua, saya tahu K1, T1, saya tahu EA, saya nak cari pada T2 yang baru, nilai K yang baru pada T2 yang baru, I can use this version. This version says, sorry, K at my new temperature, sebab kamu kena ingat, K changes with temperature. Sebab tu, kalau saya ada K pada suhu yang lama, saya kena cari nilai K pada suhu yang baru. Tetapi kalau saya tak tahu A, saya tak boleh guna original version. Saya kena guna the second version. So, the K at the new temperature equals to K at my original temperature ataupun pada suhu yang saya tahu, exponential, EA per R dah tak ada negative sign. 1 per T1 minus 1 per T2. Okay, so maksudnya kalau saya nak tahu K baru, saya ada K lama pada suhu T lama dan saya tahu suhu T yang baru dan saya tahu EA, I can use this second version of the equation. So in a simpler gist to explain to you, if I want to find the value of K, saya tak, saya tahu A, saya guna original version. Kalau saya tak tahu A, tapi saya tahu nilai K yang lain pada suhu yang lain, I can also find out based on the second version. So, you must understand another concept. Nilai K berubah dengan suhu. Maksudnya untuk satu tindak balas itu, nilai K will change with temperature. However, nilai A pre-exponential factor, nilai EA, activation energy, tak berubah dengan suhu. Maksudnya, as long as you still use the same reaction, K itu akan berubah dengan suhu. Tapi nilai pre-exponential factor, A, and activation energy, EA, tak akan berubah dengan suhu. Dia masih nilai yang sama. Okay, sebab kamu kena faham konsep tu, nanti bila penyelidikan, you get confused. Kenapa K berubah? A yang EA tak berubah. Sebab K, A dengan EA ni spesifik kepada tindak balas. Selagi tindak balas tindak balas yang sama, A, EA tak berubah. Yang berubah hanyalah nilai K kalau kamu ubah suhu. K okay, kalau ubah suhu, nilai K akan berubah. A dan EA masih sama. Right? So this is one example that uh, you can do by yourself. Okay, so it's about 10, 10. I think it's a bit too heavy for you. So to give you a bit of break, alright? So, I will not cover this question in my class today. However, the steps are already there. So, if you have extra time later on, you can try, check your understanding this question. This question is to ask on the equation of version 2. And the next question is to check your understanding. Question 2 is a bit harder, right? So I hope if you have enough time later on as a revision, you can try to do these two question on your own. In fact, satu question tu ada jawapan, satu question yang susah ni saya dah bagi jawapan. Tapi I hope you have enough time to just look at it, slide from, miss from slide, 
uh, 22, sorry, sorry, slide 23, slide 24, slide 25. If you have time to revision or later on when you have a bit of time, you can try to attempt by yourself. So I will finish at slide 25, slide 26, tak apa, saya akan teruskan kemudian. Alright, so this is all for the lecture for this week. Okay, so let me repeat back. So for this week, this is the last lecture lah. Uh, for those yang tutorial satu lagi section tu, besok dia akan ada lah. Okay, so for you is no longer, there's no more. Today is the last lecture. Next week is mid sem break, right? The following week tu hanya akan ada kelas pada hari inilah untuk kamu T2. Kelas kamu pada hari Kamis, maknanya kelas Isnin tu tak ada. Saya tak, saya tak buat kelas Isnin. Sasa Rabu lab pun saya tak buat kelas. So you have a three days break. After Raya from my class, I will meet you on Thursday, the week after Raya online. So I hope you can attend the class. But after continue, saya kena pulun sikit. Sebenarnya saya nak bagi cuti. Tapi I have to finish sampai part yang test. Sampai nanti minggu 6, kita dah boleh buat praktis. Sebab kalau saya tunggu minggu 6 untuk habiskan uh, lecture, saya takut tak sempat untuk kamu punya test. So that's why I do two hours lecture the week after Raya but only on Thursday. But if let's say kamu tak nak datang Kamis, kamu nak attend the class on Friday pun boleh. Kalau hari Jumaat is I think 10.30 class. Let's say you still nak cuti on Thursday, Friday tu sepuluh setengah tu kamu free, kamu nak attend class Friday pun boleh. Uh, I will just put the invitation according to your tutorial but if you want to attend Friday class, you just inform me Give me your email address. I will add you under the Friday class. Just attend either one of the day punya class pun already okay for me. Okay, so I wish you an early Selamat Hari Raya and uh, happy holidays. So hope you have a good time with your family and friends. So I see you back the week after Raya. Okay, so thank you everyone.